uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Sachs to give her lecture, How the Brain Invents the Mind. Thanks. Well, it's an honor to be here and to get to start off this uh, amazing looking symposium. So the problem I'm going to talk to you about today is one one part of the bigger theme of the conference. The conference is about how our brains figure out the whole world around us by modeling that world, by predicting how it works. And out of the world around us, there's many important problems our brains have to solve. But I submit to you the one we spend most of our waking hours on is the problem of other people. Right? <laughs> what we think about, what we talk about, what we worry about is other people. And especially the part of other people that is invisible inside their heads, right? We worry about what other pe people think, what they want, how they feel, what they were thinking, what they'll do next. And we do it to explain their past behaviors, to predict their future behaviors, but also to engage with them cooperatively um, and competitively, to flirt, to teach, to make moral and legal judgments of their actions. So that is the puzzle that we sometimes call the theory of mind. How do you figure out what is inside the mind of another person. I'm going to give you an example of how you do this in your everyday life right here by telling you a story. And this is going to be the first of many times in this lecture that the lecture is participatory. So get ready. I'm going to many times in this talk ask you to participate in my experiments. So this time I'm going to ask you to make a moral judgment. I'm going to tell you a story about a character and I want you to tell me your moral judgment of her action, how bad it was, how much moral blame she deserved. You're going to tell me that with your hand. So the more blame she deserves, the higher your hand goes, and everybody has to play. OK? OK, so this is a story about Grace. And she's on a tour of a chemical factory. There's a break in the tour, and she goes to make coffee. And she's making coffee for another girl on the tour who asks for sugar in her coffee. So Grace goes to the coffee machine, and next to the coffee machine is a jar of white powder labeled sugar. And Grace has no idea that this jar of white powder has been contaminated with a toxic poison from the chemical factory. So she puts the white powder in the coffee and gives it to the other girl, who drinks the coffee and, because of the contamination, dies. So how much blame does Grace deserve for putting the white powder in the coffee? Okay. Now, what if I told you the same story, except that when Grace saw the jar of white powder, it was labeled dangerous, toxic poison. <laughs> now how much does she deserve? OK, so most people here are safe to have coffee with. OK, so this task, how much moral blame, is one of the tasks we use to get an estimate of how much you're taking into consideration, not just what actually happened in the world, because in both cases, the girl drank a poisoned cup of coffee and died, but what Grace was thinking when she put that powder in. So this is the kind of data we get when we do that task. I just did it with you. These are data from a population we call typical human adults. They're MIT undergraduates. And <laughs> you can see that although it does make a difference what actually happens, people say she deserves more blame when the powder actually was poisoned and the girl died. The biggest difference is what Grace thought she was doing. If she thought it was poison, she deserves a lot of blame. If she thought it was sugar, not so much. OK, so everybody in the room who put their hand up at that second story, you made a moral judgment based not just on what happened, but what, on, what you figured out she was thinking. And that's a cool puzzle, because you never saw a belief, right? So how did you figure out it was there? How did you use it to make an inference? And how did your brain do that job? So that's the talk book of today's talk. And I'm going to try to tell you three things. One is a little bit of um, the just basic neuroscience of theory of mind, what parts of our brain we use and how they work. And I'll try to get close to some of the current work that's going on in the lab now, trying to make new progress in figuring out what these brain regions do. Then I'll talk about how we get to be that kind of brain, right? how, our, how we start as children and become the adults we are. Um, and then I'm going to talk about what this lets us understand about other people. How different, can we, how different a mind can we understand using our theory of mind? Okay, So that's what's coming, but we're going to start with just the basics of theory of mind. 
So I introduced theory of mind to you with a moral judgment task. But actually, the study of theory of mind starts with a study of young children with a very famous task called a false belief task, in which children are asked to predict somebody's behavior. And the question is, can they figure out that what somebody will do depends on what they think? So I'm going to show you a version of this task, and I'm going to show you a five-year-old who's hearing a story about somebody else and is asked to predict what they'll do. This is the first pirate. His name is Ivan. And you know what pirates really like? What? Pirates really like cheese sandwiches. Cheese? I love cheese. Yeah. So Ivan has his cheese sandwich, and he says, yum, 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 yum. I really love cheese sandwiches. And Ivan puts his sandwich over here on top of the pirate chest. And Ivan says, you know what? I need a drink with my lunch. And so Ivan goes to get a drink. And while Ivan is away, the wind comes. And it blows the sandwich down onto the grass. And now, here comes the other pirate. This pirate is called Joshua. See? And Joshua also really loves cheese sandwich. So Joshua has a cheese sandwich. And he says, yum, 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 yum. I love cheese sandwiches. And he puts his cheese sandwich over here on top of the pirate chest. So that one is his. That one's and Joshua's. That's right. Be, and then his went on the ground. Yeah, that's exactly right. Now, so he won't know which one is his. Oh, so now Joshua goes off to get a drink. <laughs> Ivan goes back and he says, I want my cheese sandwich. So which one do you think Ivan's going to take? I think he was going to take that one. Yeah, you think he's going to take that one? All right, let's see. I told you. Oh, yeah, that. you were right. He took that one. OK, so that's called passing a false belief task. And you saw that the kid was able to predict the action at the end. But also, that's, that's a very limited description. In fact, he was so anxious to figure out what the, character, what the pirate thought, he wanted to stop me telling a story, right, to say he's not going to know which one is his. And that's different from um, how three-year-olds perform this task. So this is a three-year-old. I'm not going to show you the whole thing. But trust me, he listened equally attentively all the way to the end. And here's the end. And Ivan says, I want my cheese sandwich. Which sandwich is he going to take? Do you think he's going to take that one? Let's see what happens. Let's see what he does. Here comes Ivan. And he says, I want my cheese sandwich. And he takes this one. Uh-oh. Why'd he take that one? His was on the raft. Uh -huh. Okay, so that's what a three-year-old looks like failing the false belief task. So things to notice, he's not uncertain or confused, right? He was really confident and ready to tell me what was going to happen. And when he um, saw that his prediction was wrong, right, Ivan took Joshua's sandwich instead of taking his own, the explanation he comes up with is for a reason why maybe Ivan wouldn't want his cheese sandwich anymore, right? His has fallen on the grass. OK, so people first noticed this in the 80s, that there was a big difference between how three-year-olds and five-year-olds solve false belief tasks. This led to all kinds of interesting research. It was actually originally done in order to figure out whether theory of mind is a uniquely human capacity. Can animals pass false belief tasks? Another reason it became very famous is because um, children with autism seem to have disproportionate difficulty with this task, suggesting that maybe something about passing a false belief task was tapping into whatever the deficit is in autism. And there were debates about what kind of mistake three-year-olds are making. Why don't they understand that people can have beliefs different from their own? And how five-year-olds have learned to pass this task? Do they learn it from their culture? Is it maturation of their brain? So there's all kinds of debates going on about this. And when I started training to be a scientist, the question I wanted to ask is, well, can we learn anything about how our brains do this task, we as adults? Um, and I was very lucky to start being a scientist around the time the fMRI first became possible. So fMRI, there's an MRI machine uh, up at the top. That's our MRI machine at MIT. And fMRI is a tool that lets us measure the flow of oxygenated blood through your brain without cutting any holes, which they don't let us do to undergrads. Um, <laughs> And so we can watch how blood flows, blood oxygen flows to your brain as your brain does different jobs. And we get to decide what jobs it does. And so in my first experiments, I had people lying in an MRI machine reading short little stories that describe false beliefs. So if you were in one of my experiments, you would lie by yourself, very still, in a dark tube. And you'd read a story like this. Anne made lasagna in the blue dish. After Anne left, Ian came home. He threw out the lasagna and made spaghetti in the blue dish and then replaced it back in the fridge. OK, so when Anne comes home, what does she think is in the blue dish? 
Excellent. You're all more than five. OK. <laughs> And so we could watch, where does blood flow in your brain while you're doing that? But the thing is, while you're doing that, you had to do a lot of different things with your brain, right? You had to understand language. You had to think about these options. You had to picture a blue dish. You had to picture time changing. You had to pick one of two things, and in my experiments, push a button. And I didn't want to study that. I wanted to study the part where you were thinking about her thoughts. And so we wrote other stories that were also complicated and about representations of the world, but just didn't involve thinking about thoughts. And these involve thinking about photographs. This is a photograph of an island. Then there's an eruption. And we ask what the island looks like before the eruption. That involves the same language, cognition, pushing buttons, making choices. But it doesn't involve anybody else, no other people and no other minds. And to our surprise, we found there was a brain region. Um, it's above and behind your right ear, and so sometimes called the right temporoparietal junction, where Blood oxygen goes up a lot whenever the story has somebody's thoughts in it, and not for these other stories that were also complicated and required choices and language, but didn't have other people or thoughts in them. And it wasn't just this one, actually. It's a whole group of brain regions. There's at least five in your cortex. So by the time you're a grown-up like us, at least five brain regions that show substantially more neural activity when you're thinking about somebody's thoughts than when you're doing other hard tasks. That's pretty intriguing. One of the things I spent a while doing in the very beginning of my career is trying to figure out, is it really about thoughts? Because hopefully you can tell there's many differences between these two kinds of stories. The most basic one is that only the stories about thoughts had people in them at all. And so we wrote news stories. We wrote stories about thoughts that weren't false. This is Nikki, who has a true belief about which flight his sister is on. We wrote stories about people that weren't about their minds, so what they look like, what kind of clothes they were wearing. And eventually, we also started writing stories about people's experiences that were not their mental experiences. We wrote about their physical experiences, like feeling hungry or tired, and also physical pain. So, I'll read this one. It's fun. Oscar's doing dishes after dinner. His hand hit a sharp knife. The knife cut deep into the skin between his fingers, and the cut burned in the dirty water. Blech. OK, so that's quite a vivid description of an internal state of another person, but it's a physical state, a state of their body. And what we found across all these experiments is that, in particular, the right TPJ, but indeed all of these brain regions, really seem to have a strong preference for thinking about the mind. Even descriptions of these vivid states of the body don't get the right TPJ's attention. So after about 10 years, we had got to the point where we had this hypothesis that in your cortex are brain regions whose job is something like building a model of another mind. That's pretty outlandish to begin with. And what we've been trying to do since then is figure out, well, well, what does that really mean? Like, what, what kind of model is that? And what kind of information does it have in it? And how do you get that model? And what do you use it for? And so I'm going to tell you a little bit of where that work has taken us since. One thing in particular that we've been trying to do is so that those first, those first 10 years, what we were figuring out is this brain region is for thinking about thoughts. Now what we're trying to think, figure out is, but what actually, what about thoughts is this brain region representing? What does it let you think about, about other people's thoughts? And I've said it's a model of other minds. But can I say what that means at all? To do that, um, we've been using a new approach, um, which is called pattern analysis. And so I'm going to give you a sense of what pattern analysis is in MRI. Because many of you may have heard talks about MRI before. You might be familiar with all the stuff I've said before, which is mostly about how much a brain region is involved, right? how much it lights up. There are no lights in your brain, by the way. But how much, how bright right, the, our statistical analyses are. And now I'm going to tell you a different way of thinking about brain imaging data. So I'm going to walk you through it. So, Again, imagine you're in my experiment, and you're reading stories about other people having, these, having mental experiences. So a bunch of these stories might be about people who learn things by seeing, right? Gladys sees a note on her front door. Wesley sees himself in a mirror. And as I showed you, we measure activity in a brain region, so we might look in the right TPJ and see, OK, there's a, a big response to those stories. They are, after all, stories about mental states. 
And maybe in the course of the same experiment, you also hear stories about people hearing things, right? Eric hears his fiance talking with her parents. Quentin hears a message from his mother on his phone. These are also stories about mental states, and so they also get a big response. But the question is, inside the right TBJ, is there information, not just that these are all mental states, but about the difference between them that would let you know and therefore make different inferences, because some of them are about seeing things and some of them are about hearing things. Now, the average amount of activity in the right TBJ is the same for all of these. On average, this brain region is engaged by any story about other minds. But it turns out that the right TPJ is a big chunk of your brain, and inside it are hundreds of thousands, probably millions of neurons, and they're doing different jobs. And we can get a hint of that by looking at the pattern within the right TPJ, where the hot spots are, which are the neurons that are most active, and which ones less so. So if we look at the average of activity in one set of stories, say the ones about seeing, and the average of activity, the pattern, and here you can see it looks like maybe there's a slightly different pattern for those two kinds of stories. And the way we use that information, so it's sometimes called decoding, is we then take a new story and have just the pattern. Now here you don't know anything about this story. You don't know who it's about. You don't know what they're thinking about. But the question is, if I just tell you that's the pattern in the right TPJ, can you guess, is this a story about somebody seeing something or hearing something? Excellent. OK, so that's a story about somebody seeing something. You didn't know it was a love letter, but you knew she was seeing something. And that's pattern analysis. OK, so we use that kind of technique to ask, what kinds of differences between thoughts are in the patterns of neural activity in the right TPJ. And as I hinted, this one is there. So the right TPJ cares. Did you see something or did you hear it? Another thing it cares about is the very first example I gave you of theory of mind. Did you do it on purpose or did you do it by accident? So including in the story about grace and whether she thinks the powder is sugar or poison, when you're reading these stories, there's a different pattern in your right TPJ if you're reading about um, accidental harm than if you're reading about intentional harm. And this is on average. So on average, people have these different patterns of activity in their right TPJ when they're reading about intentional harm and accidental harm. But another thing that was really cool about this is that although everybody agrees, it's worse for Grace to put the powder in the coffee if she thinks it's poison. People are not totally sure how much worse or not totally in agreement. Right? So this, I'm going to show you data from individual people. What I'm showing you on the x-axis, so across the horizontal, is for each person, how much worse is it if the harm is intentional versus accidental? If you think accidental harms are basically forgivable, some people, when I said how much blame, said none. Right? If accidental harms are forgivable, then you're going to have a big difference between intentional and accidental harm. But some people in the room might have thought, well, she was in a chemical factory. Right? Like, should she be putting white powder in people's coffees? Right? If you think that the difference is smaller, you'll be towards the left. What's going to be on the, um, the vertical axis is how different were the patterns in your right TPJ? And you can see that the more different the patterns in your right TPJ when you first read the story, the more different your moral judgments would be at the end when I ask you how much blame. And knowing just this about you, knowing just how different the patterns in your right TPJ are, I actually have quite a lot of ability to predict how different your moral judgments will be. OK, so that's two things in these brain regions. There's information about whether you're seeing or hearing. There's information about whether you did something on purpose or by accident. We actually spent a while doing this kind of one by one check, like what's another feature you might encode? Let's check for that one. But where we're at now is it would be nice to have a more systematic theory, right? Like not just a list of things about mental states that you could track, but what is it to have a theory of mind as a model altogether? So we've been working on, on something that looks more like a model. And I'm going to give you just a taste of this, because most of this work uh, is certainly not published. Lots of it is not yet done. But here's the basic idea. When we think about other people's behavior, we're thinking about it as, as the result of the things inside their mind, their expectations, their values, their intentions. And so knowing that, 
we can actually infer those expectations and values just from their actions. I'm going to give you an example from another kind of experiment we do here. You're going to see, so the, in this experiment, the um, character is not in a story, uh, but in a cartoon. These cartoons are about a hungry graduate student. The um, triangle is the graduate student. His name is Harold. And in these tasks, he's in search of lunch, as grad students always are. And the lunch options for him are food trucks. There's two parking spots for food trucks near his building. And he goes off in search of food every day. Any of the three um, food trucks could be in any of the two parking spots, right? So there's Lebanese food truck, there's a Korean food truck, and there's a Mexican food truck. And every day he goes out looking for his favorite kind of food. But he doesn't know which food truck is going to be in which parking spot. Okay, so here he is leaving his building. The door, as you can see, is on the bottom right-hand corner. And I'm going to show you what happens. So he leaves his building. He walks all the way to the side of his building and goes up, right? So he walks all the way along and up and looks and turns around and comes back and eats Korean food. What is Harold's favorite kind of food? Mexican. You see it? So he went past Korean, he saw Lebanese, and he went back to Korean. OK? So if you can figure out from this that his favorite kind of food is Mexican, that is pretty neat, right? That means you're inferring his preference for something that wasn't there at all, right? The Mexican is not in the scene. OK, so people can do this. And um, a, a generative model, a, a model that we built in a computer of how people do this, using his actions to figure out his expectations and values, can predict people's ability to do this pretty well for a whole bunch of different scenarios around Harold and where the, which truck is where and what the building looks like. So this is the kind of inside ingredients we think you need as the basic components of how we think about other minds. And just to give you a sense of how rich this can be, so you told me what he wanted, right? He wanted Mexican. But here's a different question. How did he feel when he saw Lebanese? Disappointed, right. He felt disappointed. That's a pretty specific emotion attribution. Actually, every time I ask people this, I get disappointed. Not even any of the other, not sad, not angry. There's so many emotion words that we can attribute. And yet we know that Harold felt disappointed. And our theory is actually that this is the right description of the, under, the underlying computations that we do to figure out a whole range of people's mental states, what they, saw, how, what they know, what they want, and how they feel. And we think that this will also be a good description of what the right TPJ is doing, based on some other, and one more experiment that we did. So here we were trying to push outside of just one versus another kind of mental state, trying to think of what's a whole big space of other people's thoughts and feelings that we have to um, figure out. And so we tried um, emotions, so ha figuring out what other people is feeling. In this experiment, we asked people to get to judge which of 20 different emotions a person is feeling in a, in a given experiment. Um, and I will just give you a little sense of this. I'm going to um, share with you some of the stories in this experiment and ask you to say which of two emotions the character is feeling, not which of 20, because we don't have 20 hands. OK, so in this one, I'm going to ask you, is she feeling um, furious or uh, terrified? OK, after an 18-hour flight, Alice arrived at her vacation destination to learn that her baggage, including her camping gear, hadn't made the flight. She waited at the airport for two nights and was informed the airline had lost her baggage altogether and wouldn't provide compensation. Furious. OK, this one I'm going to ask, oops, um, is she uh, embarrassed or um, disgusted? Sarah swore to her roommate she would keep her new diet. Later, she was in the kitchen getting a glass of water, took a bite of the cake she bought for the dinner party. When her roommates came home, she had broken her diet and eaten half of the cake. <laughs> Embarrassed or disgusted? Yes. Notice how subtle that is, because sometimes eating half a cake, you could feel disgusted. But in this case, she probably feels embarrassed. OK, and here's the last one. Um, OK, and this one I'm going to ask you, does she feel um, relieved or nostalgic? Brenda was testing while texting while driving. She went through a red light and hit a boy on a bike. She jumped out of the car to see if he was OK. He had a couple of scrapes, but was otherwise OK. She put, put away her phone and vowed never to text while driving again. 
relieved. Okay. Okay. So most people um, get the emotion attribution to be intended, and these are pretty fine-grained, right? You can tell the difference between many subtle different emotions from not very much information. You've never met any of these people. I gave you just a few seconds of information about them, and you know pretty specifically just what they're feeling. So do participants in our experiment. So this is on a vertical axis, the emotion we wrote the story that what was the story was intended to convey. We wrote 210 stories like this. And then on the um, horizontal axis is how often people chose each of the emotions. The line is on the diagonal because most of the time people chose the emotion that we intended to convey. Then we asked, OK, we're just going to start again from scratch, pretend we know nothing about the brain. Where is there pattern information that can let you tell which of 20 emotions a character in a story is feeling? We just looked everywhere. Where is their pattern information about which emotion a character is feeling? Um, and this is where it is. These are the brain regions that have information about one of those 20 emotions. And what you might notice is that looks pretty similar. Actually, in each of these people, we also had them do the false belief task I told you about in the beginning, which is shown in green. And the yellow is overlap. So the exact same brain regions can be found in either of these two ways, either by asking what brain regions are more involved when you think about beliefs than photographs, or by asking where is their information about what emotion a person is, which specific emotion a character is feeling. OK, that was part one. So in our brain, amazingly, are cortical regions that we use for thinking about other people's thoughts. We use them when we're thinking about other people's thoughts. We don't use them for thinking about other things about other people. And inside them, the neural patterns of activation have a lot of incredibly subtle and specific information about which thought and feeling we think somebody else is having. How do we get to have a brain like that? So those were all studies of adults. But now the question is, well, all of these adults, all the ones we studied, all the typical adults in MIT, they've all had a relatively limited set of cultural experiences and growing environments. They're all first language English speakers. Are the brains that they have and the patterns in their right TPJ, is that an inevitable feature of the biological maturation of a human brain? Or is that learned from the kinds of cultures that they've grown up in? Well, I'm going to tell you that it's plausible that a lot of it is learned. Because if we start with the key example I've been coming back to, knowing that you should be blamed less if you committed a harm accidentally, the story we started with with Grace, that actually takes quite a long time to develop. If you look at children making, being asked the question I asked you, how much should somebody be blamed for an, an unknowing mistake? Kids at four and even at five Kids say you should be blamed quite a lot for, me, for mistakes. And it's not until you get to seven, eight, and nine-year-olds that people give the kind of answers that you gave. You shouldn't, if you really didn't know you were going to cause harm, then you shouldn't be blamed. So that's a late developmental trajectory. But there's much better evidence that this is learned culturally, which is that not very long ago, a big team of anthropologists took stories based on our fMRI experiments and took them all over the world, in particular to cultures that had as little as possible contact with the modern Western world. And in each of those places, they translated these stories. So instead of a chemical factory, it became a bag of fertilizer and the town well. But they asked the same kinds of questions about how much should you be blamed and how much should you be punished if you did it knowing there was poison or um, justifiably believing it wasn't poisonous. Um, one of their sample populations was in Los Angeles, which I think is pretty close to here. And you'll be glad to know that in Los Angeles, people say you should not be blamed for accidents. Um, however, Los Angeles is not typical of the whole world. And actually, in many of the other cultures where they tested these questions, people expressed much less difference between accidental and intentional harms. And in some cultures, they said there was no difference at all. So there's a lot of cultural variability in the ways in which we incorporate mental states into our moral judgments. And that suggests that the brain regions that do this could also have cultural variability in them. Now, there's lots of ways you might want to study that. For example, you could try to take an fMRI machine to Fiji, or you could try to bring Fijians to an fMRI machine. Um, and I think those are great ideas. What I did first was try to study the children themselves. 
So I thought, this was starting a while ago, could we do these tasks not just with adults, but with children? Unfortunately, I had an amazing graduate student, Hillary Richardson, who figured out how to get a, chi a young child into an MRI machine. One trick, because the kids have to lie perfectly still, which is quite hard for three, four, and five-year-olds to do, she gave them this giant puppy and told them to cuddle the puppy to make the puppy feel better during the brain scan. This puppy is so huge that while the kids are cuddling it, they can't move. <laughs> Afterwards, she taught the kids a little bit about their brain, and this in and of itself was an amazing experience. One of the first children, child participants, we asked him afterwards, what did you learn about yourself doing this MRI experiment? He said, I discovered my brain fills up my whole head because I'm really smart. <laughs> But the best moment, actually, was, um, again, very early on, it was a four- or five-year-old we were scanning, and just at the end, we were wrapping up, we were talking to his mother, we had turned our backs on him in the room. When we turned back, he had built us a Lego MRI machine with all the parts. <laughs> it was like almost a working model. So, okay. So we were scanning children. We knew that children wouldn't be able to read visually presented stories in the scanner, and so we thought, well, how can we get kids to experience the same kind of experiment that adults had? And so we presented the stories orally, like they were listening to somebody read them a story. And like for the adults, we presented stories about people's mental states and stories about the physical world. So I'll give you a sense of what those stories are like. When Lee Chi turned 10, she discovered why her friends were disappearing. They were being taken to Garberville by a lonely and selfish fairy. Li Chi felt very mad and sad when she thought about her friends so far away from their families. She wanted to do something to help. Okay, so that's a mental story for children, and here's a physical story. In the tiny town of Chu and Swallow, it rained or snowed three times each day, once during breakfast, once during lunch, and once during dinner. But it never rained rain, and it never snowed snow. It rained things like soup and juice, and snowed things like mashed potatoes. <laughs> okay, so these stories are interesting enough that kids will listen to them, right? We need them to lie in an MRI machine for 20 minutes and hold still, so we had to make the stories interesting. And the first question is, okay, well, I told you adults, when they're hearing stories like this, there's a group of regions in their cortex that show more activity when the stories are about the mind, when they're about the physical environment. This is adults now in this same experiment, so listening to these stories, and we replicated the same result. But what about kids? Would, and the first experiment, we were studying kids age 5 to 12 years old. Would they also show um, more activity for mental states than other stories in these same brain regions? And the answer to that question is yes. Every brain region that in adulthood is specialized for thinking about other minds already shows that preference by five years old. We now know in other data that's also true in, by three years old. But we noticed something interesting. I told you that in adults, it's not just that the, um, this region responds more to stories about the mind than about the physical world, but it responds more to stories about the mind than any other kind of story. Now, in this experiment, we also had a third kind of story. We had stories about people that were about their appearance, and I'll let you listen to one of those. The new girl in the class was dressed in the same clothes as everyone else, but she still looked different. Her eyes weren't blue or green or brown. They were yellow, and her hair wasn't blonde or brown or black. It was green. Even her skin had a strange pale glow, like the moon. So these are stories about people, but things you can see about them from the outside. And as before, we found that in adults, those stories did not get a response in the, in the TPJ. It was very low to stories about anything other than the mind. But when we looked at kids, we saw something different. So in the older kids, these stories got an intermediate response. And in the youngest kids in this experiment, actually, these brain regions were responding to anything about a person. So not only stories about their mind, and this reminded us of other brain regions that in adults play really specific functions. One of the ways that they seem to develop is by starting out with more general roles and then specializing by suppressing responses to some things to leave just the particular job that they're going to do in adulthood. So we came up with this hypothesis that part of how we develop our model of other minds is by selecting that and suppressing other things in the job of these brain regions. So that was the hypothesis. 
And again, as I said, our hypothesis is that children are doing this in part by learning from their culture. They're learning from their culture what their culture's model is of how other minds work, what explains other people's behavior. But to test that hypothesis, we still needed to distinguish between learning and maturation, right? Th those two things go together in childhood. For the most part, as you mature, in the sense of getting biologically older, you learn more. And so it's really hard sometimes to know, or what you, is what you're seeing the result of learning and teaching, or is it just getting older, right? So how could we distinguish learning from maturation? Well, we decided to do it by um, studying a group of children who have different access to the minds around them. And those are children born deaf. So there's already quite a bit of evidence that um, children born deaf have more variable experiences of other people's minds. In particular, some children born deaf are born into families that already speak sign language. And in those families, they are suffused in a linguistic environment from the moment of their birth, just as oral language speaking children are. But some children are born deaf into a family where nobody yet speaks sign language. And so for those infants, it can be a while, it can be months, it can even be years before they regularly have access to somebody who speaks a language that they perceive. And so those children can have a long delay in their access to conversation. And one thing that has already been noticed is that that delay in access to, to language causes a delay in theory of mind. So this is proportion correct on a theory of mind task. The, the gray dots are oral English speaking children tested in English. The blue and orange dots are ASL speaking children, sign language speaking children tested in sign language. The native signers have been, had access to sign language since they were born and look just like oral English speaking children. But the children who had delayed access to sign language showed delayed, access, delayed performance on this theory of mind task. Now from our own data and from other people's data, we know two interesting things. One is that this is not a language deficit per se. These kids are already fluent ASL sign language speakers by the time we see them. So by the time they're 5 to 12 and in our study, they are um, identical to, the, to native signers in their language proficiency. And the other thing is this delay is not permanent. By a few years from after this, the delay will be gone. So it's a temporary delay. But it was an opportunity to study how um, brain development is related to this particular kind of experience, this particular alteration of experience. And in our day, you can see there's some children that look more different um, from the typical trajectory, and those are the children who had the longer delays. So the longer the delay in access to sign language, the longer the delay um, in theory of mind. So what we wondered is, okay, a child who's, let's say, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, so their biology of their brain is the biology of seven, or eight, seven, eight, nine, ten year old, but they've had that much less experience talking to people because they've had language for so many fewer years. What would their TBJ look like? Would it look like the TBJ of somebody of their chronological age? Or more like somebody with the same amount of experience in conversation about the mind? To test that, we had to translate all of our stories into sign language. Um, so this is one of the stories in the, the children's experiment, but now in sign language. This is in the mental state condition. Um, this is what the physical condition looks like. This is a story about the physical environment. And this is actually the first time anyone's ever done a theory of mind task in an MRI machine in sign language, so we had no idea what we were going to find. And so the first question is, OK, well, I told you in English, stories about the mind get activation in these cortical regions compared to stories about the physical world. What about in sign language? It's actually not obvious, because in sign language, the, the stimulus is a really social video, right? It's a person making facial expressions and gestures and so on. You might think if this is just about any social information, that we wouldn't get a difference here. But actually, we got exactly the same difference. I think this is totally neat, because it suggests that what this brain region cares about, and this is what I've been arguing all along, is not the surface feature of the stimulus, the meaning, right? It's the content of the mind being modeled that's being talked about in the story that activates this brain region, not just the surface feature of a person making facial expressions and gestures.
Okay, so in ASL, we get activation in these same brain regions. Now, what about development? So I told you that between 5 and 12, the age of these kids, is the emergence of this really selective response, right? Not only does the RTBJ respond more to stories about the mind than stories about the physical environment, but also stories about people, all stories about people, right? The social purple bar. So that, this is the now data replicating that in native signing ASL speakers. But what, there, here's the key question, right? What about the kids with delayed access to sign language? Would they look like somebody of their chronological age or someone with more similar experience in talk about the mind? And we found the latter. So kids with delayed access to conversation showed delayed selectivity in this brain region. And the extent of the delay was predicted by how delayed uh, their access to sign language was. So, this is only one way of asking the question, but I think it hints at the bigger picture of the answer, that the kind of brain activation patterns that we saw in adults, both the selectivity and I imagine probably also the patterns of information, those are the states of our brain, but they're not immutable facts of our biology. We come to have the brains we have, we come to make the models of other minds we do through learning and through enculturation. I also think this is neat because in some ways this is evidence that some part of me feels like, isn't it spooky? Conversation changes your brain. And some part of me is like, no, obviously it does. Of course. In fact, all of your brains are changing right now. Um, but I do love this idea that the, the way we change one another's brains um, is through talking to them. So children's brains specialize through learning. A question that obviously arises when you see these kinds of data is, OK, well, that's from 5 to 12, but what happens before that, right? I showed you theory of mind development. There's these huge changes from age 3 to 5. Actually, there's huge changes all the way from 0 all the way until I think I'm still developing my theory of mind. Um, I am deeply interested in development before age 5. Um, this is not a talk I'm going to give today, but one of the things we do in my lab now is scan infants to see what the earliest state is. We have a specially designed coil for infants, and then they watch movies through a mirror. They hold perfectly still, as you can see. Um, <laughs> but I'm not talking about babies today. Today I'm talking about one last thing. So I told you we have a theory of other minds, we build models of other minds, we use it to understand other minds, we get that model from our experience. How far does it go? Can we understand an experience we've never had? I call this section the happiness of the fish because there's this quotation from an ancient Chinese text that goes like this. Shuang Tse observed, see how small the fish are, how the small fish are darting about. That is the happiness of the fish. You are not a fish yourself, said Hui Tse. How can you know the happiness of the fish? And you not being I, retorted Chuang Tse, how can you know that I do not know? <laughs> I like to start that way, but it is a puzzle that people have worried about. As long as they've thought about theory of mind, they've wondered this. How different from your own experience can somebody else be and you still understand them? Do we understand people through similarity, through remembering our most common experience, through mimicry and matching? If so, that's a little depressing to me, right? If our theory of mind extends only to people to whom we are already similar and with whom we already share experiences, it seems not to be living up to its potential, right? The hope is you could use your theory of mind even to get outside of your own experience, to understand somebody having an experience really different from your own. So is that possible and how far does it go? Well, to ask that, I've been using a case study where we know for sure about an experience a group of people hasn't had. We've been studying what people born blind can know about sight. Because if somebody born blind can know a lot about sight, then surely we can know about people who just live far away or in different circumstances. So what can congenitally blind people know about sight? Well, there's some extreme examples. For example, there are blind painters. This is Ashraf Armajan. He is blind and has been blind his whole life. His paintings have perspective, color, shadows. It's totally amazing. But you might think, OK, fine. But he's one lunatic expert. I work in a place where there are a lot of lunatic experts. Um, what does this have to say about, in general, what can a general person understand about an experience they've never had? And so we thought, OK, 
We'll ask what blind people know about the meanings of everyday visual experiences. So again, I'm going to have you participate in this experiment. You're going to use your hands. This experiment is about verbs. We just give people two verbs and we ask, how similar are these two verbs in meaning? So if they're not similar, keep your hand low down. If they're very similar, your hand goes all the way up. And think about what you're doing when you do this, OK? How similar are to feel and to stroke? To chime and to beep? To crackle and to squeak? To glance and to gaze? To sparkle and to twinkle? To gleam and to glitter. OK, so now imagine to yourself you did that for eight hours, <laughs> which is what our participants did, bless them. Each one answered almost 3,000 questions like that, giving us a phenomenal data set on people's understanding of the meanings of these words. So you never have to collect such data again. We have shared them publicly. So everybody's ratings of every pair of word is available if anybody wants to use them for anything. Um, I have sighted participants did this um, looking at uh, images on the screen. Blind participants did it with a, a screen reader. OK, and so we have these giant data sets of pair, these really fine-grained pairwise similarities. And what we can ask is, OK, However you figured out how similar to chime and to beep or to crackle and to, to squeak are, that's based on your experience of auditory events, right? Now, what about when you figured out to sparkle and to twinkle or to gleam and to glitter, right? Do you have to have seen gleaming and glittering? Do you have to have seen sparkling and twinkling to know how similar they are? OK, so that's what we asked. Um, just to give you a sense of what these data look like, so this is for a bunch of verbs that are not about um, seeing or hearing. Um, the, this is the form of the data I'm going to show you. Each dot is a pair of verbs. On the horizontal is the ratings made by one group of sighted people. On the vertical is a different group of sighted people in the gray bar here. And the fact that all the dots are on the line tells you that two groups of sighted people agree which pairs are most similar and which pairs are less similar. The shared meanings of these words. Now, if being blind makes it harder to share those meanings, then the blind people's dots should not all be clustered on the line. Maybe they'd all be below. Maybe they'd just be spread all over, right? But in any case, they'd be less clustered on the line than they are for sighted people. And that's not what we found here. But of course, these verbs are not about seeing, right? These are verbs whose meaning doesn't depend on experiences of sight. We found the same thing for verbs of touching. Again, this doesn't depend on the experience of sight. So you may think, great, sighted and blind people share the meanings of verbs as long as those verbs don't depend on seeing. What about the verbs of seeing? So these are verbs about actions of seeing, like gaze, glance, peer. And these were just as similar. We did that also for qualities. This is motions, crunch, curgle, hiss, squeak, right? These are the sounds of things. And here's the visual qualities. In brief, everything you know about the meanings of visual verbs, a person born blind knows too. And then people said, well, OK, they know what the words, they know how the words are used. But do they know what they mean? Do they think about them in the same way we do? And that's one of those moments where I'm grateful I'm a neuroscientist, because I can say, well, I'll look in their brain, right? If they know what they mean, they should represent this information in their brain just like we do. And so remember, I told you a while ago, oops, I gave it away, about this experiment where we had people hearing about or reading about people's experiences of seeing things, of hearing things, and there were actually control non mental stories in that as well. I told you that if the story is about hearing, you get a big response. If the story is about seeing, you get a big response. But those responses are different in the pattern. Our brains care whether you saw something or whether you heard something in the pattern of the right TPJ. So is all of this also present in the brain? When they think about somebody seeing, is it different from somebody hearing? And does it recruit the exact same brain regions for attributing mental state experiences that we use when we're attributing experiences of seeing? And the answer to both of those is yes. 
And this, I think, is optimistic. Right? Just by living with people who see, without ever experiencing sight, blind people know everything we can measure about what it's like to see. They know what the, even the subtle details of gleaming and glistening, and even what, it, what inferences that makes about other people's minds. I think there's a lesson here that if we want to, we can understand experiences we have never had, could never have, experiences of a mind as different as possible from our own. But that doesn't mean we always do it, right? And actually, I think blind people know a lot more about seeing than sighted people know about being blind. Because it's not the same thing as closing your eyes. And I think what that's about is that it is easy for a minority to know about the experience of a majority. And it's easy for a majority to ignore the experience of a minority. So without having an experience, it is possible to understand another mind. But you have to try. OK, so I told you our brains have an incredible model inside them, a model of other minds. We use this to predict, explain, interact with, teach, flirt, compete against, and morally judge others. I do think that the ability to do this is part of our biological nature as having human brains, but the details of how we do it, of how we understand other people's minds, come from our culture and are enculturated in our childhoods. And I think also this gives us an incredible opportunity to understand the experiences, even if pe people completely unlike ourselves, experiences we will never share. Um, and we learn about them through listening. Thank you.